Great. So we might have a couple more people joining us a little bit late, but let's dive right in. I think this is going to be a great conversation today, and I want to make sure we have enough time to really spend together. So welcome again. Thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar with David Osset um, for a conversation about his movie, Mayor. My name is Sarah Sturm. I'm a member of the Telos team in Washington, D.C., but I'm currently coming to you from Vermont. For those who are joining us for a Telos event for the first time, the Telos Group is an American nonprofit of peacemakers based here in DC, and our mission is to form communities of peacemakers across the lines of difference and equip them to help reconcile seemingly intractable conflict at home and abroad. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge where we're at right now in the world, and especially in Israel-Palestine and the context that this conversation today is occurring in. As I'm sure you're all aware, um, violence in Israel-Palestine has been escalating not only over the past few days, but over the past few weeks and well what we're seeing right now was predictable it didn't come out of nowhere but doesn't mean it was inevitable um, and as we amplify calls for de-escalation we also have the opportunity and agency to continue addressing the realities on the ground that led up to this current moment um, telos has been and will continue to dive into the different aspects of how we've arrived at this moment it's an ongoing conversation we're going to be having and i think that today's film and discussion are gonna be a really vital part of helping us understand that under occupation, Palestinians haven't been experiencing peace even before this week. So while our hearts are really heavy with the, the ongoing violence and the increased civilian casualties, this is a timely conversation that will help us hopefully figure out how we can address the realities on the ground and advocate a just peace for Israelis and Palestinians. Today, we've got the privilege of speaking with um, David Osset, the director and the award-winning documentary filmmaker of Mayer. David's an incredibly multi-talented filmmaker. Um, he's an Emmy award-winning director, editor, composer. He does so much on all of these films and they've been screened at film festivals around the world. David, we're really glad to be joined by you today. A little housekeeping note, I'll start off with some questions for David and then we'll shift to questions from all of you. We can hope but this is a conversation among all of us. As you have questions, if, if you wanna put them in the chat, I'll invite you to unmute and ask your question live yourself when it's time. So David, super grateful to have you here today. The first thing I'd love to know more about is, you know, there are so many compelling stories and angles to tell about the Palestinian story. Why was this the story you wanted to tell and how did you get connected to Musa and have access to be able to tell it in the first place? Thank you so much for having me, and it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, you know, I, I'd spent um, about a decade off and on working in and around the Middle East. I studied at the American University in Cairo. I was studying refugee law there before I got interested in filmmaking and uh, visited Palestine a couple of times uh, as an activist, as a tourist. Um, and uh, years passed, I got into filmmaking. Uh, I ended up working as an editor on a documentary in Ramallah called um, called Off Frame by a, a Palestinian director named Mohammed Yakubi, and that was in 2015. And it had been several years, maybe three or four years, since I'd been to Ramallah, and I was amazed how much it seemed to have changed uh, in in those years to my eyes. It seemed like all of a sudden there were hipster bars and nightclubs and free and limited public Wi-Fi and there was a Jaguar dealership and all these things that. Um, were kind of unexpected and um, kind of the more time I spent there, more than just being a tourist, I started to see this, you know, this large Christian population. Um, and uh, what was interesting to me and what was surprising to me is that I was surprised. I was, surprised. I, I was basically, I, I was, I, I'm just starting to get an echo for some reason. I'm not sure what happened, but that's, yeah, it seems to be gone. If now. everyone on the call could mute themselves, that'll help with that. Thank you. Um, but I, uh, I, I, was, I was surprised that basically, here I was, someone who had spent all this time in the Middle East, studied it, knew lang the language, uh, but was still bringing in this monolithic sort of Western definition of what a Middle Eastern city should look like. And that, and, and Ramallah didn't fit the bill. It didn't fit um, the sort of one dimensionality because uh, it's such, such a complicated city and there's so many, there's haves and have nots and it's the center of, you know, all these nonprofit organizations and it's also, surrounded by settlements and refugee camps. Uh, it, and it's also the center of the PA and it's also a cosmopolitan and it snows in the winter and there's Christians and all these things that didn't really jive with my with my, my lack of knowledge basically. So I kept thinking about that and I kept being really shaken by, yeah, just how 
even though I had all this knowledge and information, I still was was not getting a, a full story. Uh, and then uh, a year later, we finished the film, me and Mahana, then he came to New York where I live and and we, we screened the film and he was staying with me. And I remember asking him, hey, out of curiosity, what's the mayor of Ramallah like? And uh, he said, oh, you know, he's very funny. He's very charismatic. He, you always see him walking around town with his, uh, his vape, his like e-cigarette. Um, and, uh, and I know his brother, he's Christian. The mayor of Ramallah by law has to be Christian. And all of this was absolutely putting a light bulb up in my head of just desperate to know what his job was like, desperate to understand more of what it was like basically to run a city without a country. And I felt like this unexpected mayor of this unexpected city, your local government, it could all be a really wonderful window into this, um, this story. Thanks for that introduction. There are so many pieces there that I'd love to keep unpacking. Um, and first, how did you, you know, get connected with Musa? I, I imagine it's not every day that he gets a cold call from a filmmaker saying, can I follow you around for the next amount of time, you know, making a film where we don't know what's going to happen in the, the political reality. How did you make that connection and what was building that relationship like? I, you know, I, I took a meeting with him through Mahanad, who knew his brother, like I, like I mentioned, and I went to the office. I, I really doubt that he expected much of this meeting. Um, I think he's, as you can see in the film almost as well, like he's, he's meeting with tons of people from the West all the time who are promising things. And uh, I'm sure he didn't think of me much different than that when I, I came into his office and said, I wanna follow you for two years. I wanna follow the municipality of Ramallah for two years. Uh, most people, including Musa, were a bit mystified as to why I'd wanna do such a thing. And, um, but, but he understood. We, well, the interesting thing and the reason I think it worked uh, and the reason he agreed basically is that we had a similar goal. His goal as mayor of Ramallah, in addition to running the city and taking care of the festivals and streets and all these things, uh, his goal was also basically as an unofficial diplomat to represent the city of Ramallah to the rest of the world, to represent Palestine to the rest of the world. That's one of the things he sees his job as being. Now, granted, Musa Hadid's version of Ramallah is not everyone's version of Ramallah. It's, it's not... And it's not a uh, it's it's too complicated of a city and I never saw myself as the biographer of Ramallah certainly not of the biographer of Palestine I saw myself as telling Musa's story and his story was how he saw the city and my goal was to show that basically to show how a, an elected official in Ramallah is trying to exercise power and also showing the limits of that official's power. And a theme in the film is very much about the limits of, of power and the limits of ability to Mayor Musa, of course he's the mayor, but even in the first 10 minutes of the film, when he's trying to get the radio, when he's when he hears about the embassy move, it, it's, it's a bit comedic, but it's also symbolic. Uh, and there are many moments like that in the film that are a, a, a lot about the limits of Palestinians in terms of their ability to uh, which is not their fault, obviously, but but the, the limits of Palestinians and their ability to actually uh, affect change within their own society versus the fact that they're occupied by a foreign military power that exercises control over their land financially, uh, socially, and politically. So I, uh, I, I think he understood why I was interested in local government. There were things that we talked about and then things that I didn't share right away, but was thinking and feeling like, that you know, basically a mayor, everyone knows what a mayor does. Not every single person even on this call probably understands all the minutia and details of the occupation and the history of it and the details around it. But I, I will guarantee with my life savings that every single person on this call knows what a mayor basically does. And that's true anywhere in the world. Uh, it's, it's true in Washington DC, it's true in New York City, it's true in Ramallah. And the idea is, you know, if, if everything's going okay in your city, you're like, okay, that's fine. And things are going wrong. It's the mayor's fault. And, and that was, that to me felt like such a, a relatable beleaguered position to, to have. Um, and there was so much kind of baked in humor to municipal government because it's people basically trying very, very hard for something that on the outside seems very simple, like putting on festival, like paving the roads. Uh, but people who were working day and night to do these things. And I thought that that would be a really amazing avenue in for audiences who basically my, my, my ideal audience was people who, who hadn't been to this region or maybe had been once or thought that it was too complicated to engage with. 
I really wanted to make an, a safer space for people to learn about this without feeling like they were judged for not having some the same education I did, basically. I wanted to make a safer entry point. So with those audiences, have people been responding well to the film? Are they understanding what you're trying to do? Or have people, um, you know, not reacted the way you expected? I'd love to hear a little bit more about you know, your intended audience and then who the audiences have been and how they've reacted. Absolutely. I mean, the reaction's actually been better than I dreamed of. Um, we obviously premiering a film in March of 2020 created a very strange uh, relationship between me and my audience and that a lot of them were people I'd never seen. But we did get one, um, the films played at three physical film festivals um, and about 85 virtual film festivals. Uh, and it's been released around the world. It's been in cinemas. Um, it's having its theatrical release in Australia right now where there's where there's no COVID. Um, but our first screening was at a film festival in um, Columbia, Missouri, which is for those of you who don't know, halfway between St. Louis and Kansas City and College Town. Um, but it was, you know, 1700 people in a theater uh, you know, standing at the end of the film and giving standing ovation basically to this fountain that you see at the end and people laughing throughout the film, people finding an intense amount of humor in it, which was intentional. And because the the, the humor in the film for me is is not all about laughing at the people in the film. It's about dignified people in undignified situations, which to me is the crux of what the occupation of Palestine is. So that humor, I think, is actually kind of a uh, a sneaky element that I was really hoping that audiences would feel comfortable to laugh in the film. I really wanted audiences to feel in those first few minutes that they could laugh. Uh, like for me, the the scroll at the beginning of the film, the Star Wars text, that that makes me laugh, uh, you know, because it's it's so serious. But then you're seeing a shot of a cafe and uh, and I and then the you know the city branding meetings immediately following that and all these moments that just I, I hope give you permission to relate to the things you're watching and giving you an understanding that you're not actually watching a film about the and I say this in really heavy quotation marks the Israeli-Palestinian conflict it's not about that it's about a, it's about the mayor of a town who's trying to plan his Christmas festival and then a mayor of a town who's trying to build a fountain and what goes wrong and what doesn't go right and um, but also with this deeper understanding of what all these themes in the film are really trying to say. I really appreciate your point about humor and being able to engage this with a sense of levity. One of the things we talk about at Telos is joyous implication, just mm. because we recognize that we are complicit with some of these things or that there's a lot of violence that as peacemakers we need to work as to address. That doesn't mean that we can't engage in this work joyously and there has to be room to, to hold the good and the bad and to you know, in, enjoy the process of trying mm. to transform really violent conflict. Um, so I really appreciate you naming that. To the, to the point of Musa being a really relatable and you know figure that you come to love throughout the course of this film, at least for me, um, one of the things you touch on and you, you talked about with leadership, and this is going back to, I think, the bigger context of where we're at today as well. For me, there was one really kind of poignant movie in the film where Musa says to one of the people he works with, we cannot try to replace the official leadership. We're not trying to replace the leadership. And there are times where, you know, delegations or even Palestinians come in and potentially see him as more of an authority figure than he actually is because he is working on a municipal level to, to enable Palestinians to live better lives or, or to bring joy in Christmas celebrations. Um, and one of the things that tell us that we've talked about with the, the current violence in Israel and Palestine is that we've seen a real failure of upper leadership by both Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so I'd, I was wondering, that's kind of a, a long way to get to this question, but I, I think is an important context to kind of dive into is, you know, diplomatically as someone who's making this film, I think it's really clear that Musa is not trying to be the, you know, big head honcho Palestinian leader, but what does it mean to focus on someone who is a really effective leader in a context where that leadership is kind of curtailed because of existing power structures? Yeah, you know, I think it's an excellent question. Um... I the this you might see this answer as a cop out, but I do genuinely believe that it's the best answer I can give, which is that I really learned while making this film the difference between a politician and a public servant. That definition, I think, is extraordinarily blurred in the United States. I think it's extraordinarily blurred basically everywhere in the world. Um, but watching Mayor Hadid uh, do his work in the city 
yes, of course, he's a politician. He's running for office. He's campaigning, all these things. There's machinations. There's politics involved. He's a member of FETA. Um, uh, I, I also, though, saw that there was something far more important to him than what political party he belonged to and what happens when one tries to become a career politician of some sort. I saw that Musa's goal at its core, a hundred percent of the time was the well-being of his city. That's, that's something he would frequently say when we were uh, when we were chatting, when the cameras were off, sometimes when the cameras were on, was, was that he, he wasn't the mayor. He just had the job for a few years. And I really loved that. And I kept trying to figure out how I could basically change the title of the film to be more suggestive of that reality. But I also know that if I'm making the film for American audiences, I, I understand that people are bringing in baggage, not necessarily bad baggage, but baggage into the idea of what a mayor is. And Musa, you know, carries himself with so much dignity and aplomb uh, and, and kind of, to me, reminded me of like a, a Hollywood character, like a golden age of Hollywood figure, like a Spencer Tracy, Gary Cooper type. And I wanted to use that cinematically and filmically within the story. But I also knew that um, you see Musa as a person of power because of the gulf of power, because of the, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, because of the gulf of, um, of control. And people are looking to Musa as this leader, as this uh, figure, um, because there is, yeah, frankly, an absence otherwise uh, within leadership. I think that Musa never saw that as his responsibility. I think Musa, frankly, never saw traveling around the world to the US and to the UK and to Germany and to South Africa being an ambassador as his responsibility either, but desperate times. And um, I think what I basically wanted to focus on was the leadership of, uh, of an individual, not the leadership of a country. I think what compelled me with this film was that it was human size. And, and that it was, it was more so about what is important to us at the end of the day, um, perhaps isn't what our political allegiance is or where we stand in terms of um, this camp or that camp, but it's our dignity. It's uh, our ability to live our lives. And to me, I would imagine that if you stripped away all politics, that would still be important to Palestinians the same way it would be for anyone else. And I really wanted the film to focus on the human aspect of that. I hope that answers the question and not a copping out sort of way. No, I did not feel like that was a cop out. If that was a cop out, you can keep copping out. <laughs> um, so, so for me, one of the things I found really interesting in the kind of humanizing aspect was, I'd love to talk a little bit about the role of religion and Christianity in the film. Um, we have a, a large part of our network are evangelical Christians and potentially on the call today we've got a, a lot of evangelical Christian friends as well. And I think one of the things that, you know, I've come to learn through working with Telos is that a lot of people, you know, first of all, don't always know that there are Palestinian Christians who are one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. And if they do, they think about them as being in Bethlehem. You know, even for me, when I, I started doing this work, Ramallah didn't bring to mind, you know, Christianity. It's not a place a lot of people visit on, on pilgrimage sites. And, you know, when we see other films that are maybe about Palestinian Christians or, or Palestine, you know, to me, this is a, a pretty unique one focusing on a, a Palestinian Christian mayor of Ramallah in the West Bank, who is holding all these things in tension, as, as you were saying. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about how that came into play in your telling of this story or why that was something that was important to focus on as well. For those of you folks who are Christian or evangelical Christian or however you identify, I'd like to say thank you for showing up. Uh, to watch this film. Um, that's a bigger leap than a lot of people are taking these days. Um, the idea of Palestine has become so toxic to so many people. The idea of talking about Palestine and talking about human rights for Palestinians has become almost a, um, a, a slur for a huge amount of the American population. And it's a really disturbing thing to me uh, as a Jewish person. That's disturbing to me. It's, it disturbs my conscience as a Jew that the, uh, the idea of talking about uh, this group of people um, and believing that they should have equal rights is tantamount to anti-Semitism. I couldn't disagree more. And um, I really wanted to, to say thank you, first of all. Second of all, um, I think it's important to note that uh, I don't think that you should care more about Palestinians because there's Christians there. I don't think you should care more about the people in Ramallah 
because you find out that they're Christian. We all know that that's not, you know, that's not the case. It, it, just because we know that there are, you know, people who are having the same faith as us in sub-Saharan Africa or in other parts of the world doesn't mean that our conscious automatically kicks into gear and we care about them more. What's interesting to me, and the reason I found it interesting, and the reason I wanted to focus on, on to a degree, the Christian element of Ramallah, is I want you to notice that there's things you don't know. And that was something I didn't know. And that was something that you didn't know. And it's something that your friends don't know. And if that's something you don't know, then there's so many other things you don't know in terms of how we relate to people, in terms of how people are complex and people hold complexity. And no one's just one thing. Palestine is not just terrorists. It's not just victims. It's not just Christians. It's not just Muslims. And to show all the complexity and multitudes of Ramallah, just for a little bit, for 80 minutes, that was the goal. It's so that next time you think about Palestine, the next time you're talking to people about Palestine, the next time you get into an argument about Palestine, you know that it's not about some one-dimensional land of victims or one-dimensional land of terrorists. Uh, and understand that the people here are just as complicated and nuanced, it seems almost silly to say, but of course, I mean, they, they deserve just as much as anyone else does. And it's being strategically denied. No, another really great point. Um, before I ask my next question, I want to remind everyone that we'd love to hear your questions as well. So as you have thoughts or questions for David come up, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them shortly. Um, the next thread I'd like to pick up on, David, is, you know, how as a filmmaker you balance, and you mentioned this before, showing flourishing Palestinian life and the very harsh realities of trying to live flourishingly under occupation. Um, I'm sure you got a, a lot of footage of, you know, both the really beautiful moments from the Christmas celebration to the lighting of the fountain and the really challenging moments where you're following Musa around as, you know, um, as the army's invading or, or that moment in the hotel where, you know, you're not sure what's going to happen next. One of the things I found really remarkable in looking through the credits is that you had a huge influence on this film in so many stages of the process. And I'd love you to talk more about, well, so two part question. One, how that helps you tell the story better. And then two, as a storyteller, how you balance that story of flourishing and violence. That's a wonderful question. Um, I, well, first of all, uh, I was the only real person who was involved in making the film. So, so it was, uh, I was what we call a one person band. Um, I was shooting the film, I was doing sound, I was running around and talking to people and getting release forms and, um, and editing when I got back home. I was producing the film, so I was doing all the fundraising basically on my, on my flights back and forth between New York and um, between New York and, and Ramallah, uh, I was I was just writing grant materials and emailing people, and it was it was exhausting. Um, but what that meant was that I basically uh, knew what kind of questions I wanted to ask from the beginning. And for me, every film I ever make is basically about asking a question, and the film itself is the answer. And in this case, it was like I was saying earlier, which was this question kept haunting me, which was this idea of how do you run a city when you don't have a country? How do you run a city underneath the shadow of, of a foreign military occupation? Um, and I, I didn't know the answer. Um, I knew elements of the answer, but I didn't know um, exactly where the film would take me, but I knew how I wanted to ask those questions. And I knew, for example, that while I was making the film, I wanted to avoid these cliched representations of Palestine that I had seen time and time again by Western filmmakers. So many films coming in where this sort of like there but for the grace of God feeling like the camera just falls from a helicopter and you're just filming everything on all the action in the streets and it's like it, it's basically just it's a war zone from beginning to end. And I really wanted to reject that. I wanted to have different rules for the film. I wanted to settle you into a calmer space and I knew eventually in making a film about local government where, cause I knew I did a lot of research. I did about a year of research before I started filming. So I would, I would go there without a camera, just talk to people, find potential subjects, talk to people about what was going on, what was new in the city, what the, what people felt about the municipality, what, what people's grievances were with it, what it really 
did, what its job was. And the more I learned, the more it was helpful. I was, I had a really large scope at the beginning. I was filming at architectural heritage foundations. I was filming at nursing homes. I was filming in refugee camps. I was filming very, very far outside the municipality, but I kept coming back to the municipality because a, they seemed really amenable to my presence and they, and I, they were really excited. But then I kept thinking, I've seen the other stuff. I've, I've seen footage from clashes so many times. I've seen so many of those depictions. And so I set these rules for myself, which were if I've seen it, I'm, not, I'm either A, not going to film it, or I'm gonna film it differently. And I kept trying to stick to that where it came, when it came to the, the meetings with, with Musa and when it came to speeches and protests. For example, the first time you see a protest in the film, you know, how many times have we seen footage of protests? We, we, we zone out. I don't even think we're watching it when we see that footage. I think we basically relegate it to the world of its news. And just, we, we, it, it becomes like a, a switch that flips. Like we now know that there was a protest in Manara, like in the downtown square of Ramallah. Like that is a thing that happened. But I kept thinking, how can I make this feel as complicated as it is? And then that first protest I was filming, I heard these guys on the loudspeaker saying, go home if you're bored. You know, like the, you, you all are looking disaffected. You go, why don't you, like, it, it's embarrassing to be here if you're not caring about. It. And to me, that spoke volumes of like, wow. So yeah, there are some people who maybe are disheartened at this point. There are some people who are maybe exhausted with standing up and protesting. All that did to me was add complexity in a really interesting way. And I wanted to give that to an audience, trusting that an audience doesn't need to understand every detail they just want to see a world that looks like their own inner inner mind, where things are complicated. Things aren't as simple as every Palestinian person in Ramallah is unified around one cause, uh, and and they feel exactly the same way. That adds to me, even if it's something you I agree with politically, it 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 adds to me of this very traditional depiction of just Palestinians are one mass. They're just one big group, and they all act this, and that's not the case. And it's, I'm, I don't bring it up again. I, I feel like a, a broken record, but I don't bring that up to try to say that one opinion is better than the other. It's, it's just about human complexity. And if we can understand something as being complicated, we get more curious about it. And the things that we love are the things that we try to get to know better. Absolutely. Um, in the chat, Lise Breton said it's it's such a quiet, nuanced film. And I think that that's absolutely correct and really speaks to the relationship you built with Musa that let you get those insights into the quieter moments that I think tell much more of the story than the, you know, as you mentioned, the kind of traditional news media footage of, of people in the streets. I think that that's a, a really unique aspect of your film and, and why I hope that the people on this call will bring it to their other friends and family later. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, one other I wanted thing. to make a, I wanted to make a, um, I kept telling myself also early on to, as sort of the second part of the answer to your question, I kept telling myself, I want to make a fable. Like I want to make something that feels almost like a fable in terms of it being about something very simple. But of course, it's not ever going to be a fable when it takes place with the military occupation. Um, so I figured, what if I was telling a very simple story, but then all these elements would pierce that simplicity. For example, filming the municipality around, I kept telling myself basically, I don't know how, but at some point the occupation is going to assert itself into the frame. And I don't know exactly how it will, but I know it's going to happen. And on my fourth day of filming, I remember it was a lot of conversations about Christmas still, a lot of conversations about the parkouring Santa Clauses. And I remember calling up my partner back at home while I was shooting. I was like, I, you know, I really don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how much longer I'll just be filming people having meetings about Christmas. Yeah. And uh, she reminded me to be patient, which was fundamental to this film for filming 350 hours of footage. Patience was very important. But I, uh, the fifth day, I walk into Mayor Moose's office and his priest is there and we all find out together about the embassy move, uh, which no one knew about. And that, that just was that, and I mean, the occupation asserting itself was constant. It was constant. All I had to do was open my eyes to different ways the occupation asserts itself. It's not just in the way that we read about on the news. It's not just the way that we see it right now. What we're seeing right now happening 
is a very obvious way that the occupation asserts itself. Bombs, explosions, people's homes being destroyed, people being evicted from their homes. That is 100% a factor of the occupation. Here are the other factors of occupation. Palestine doesn't have its own currency. You know, Palestinians cannot enter Jerusalem, which is 10 miles away, as, as Musa talks about in his speech. There is no right of return for Palestinian citizens, even though Israelis are able to go on free trips to Israel at the age of 18 to 26 in the United States and are able to claim citizenship just by signing a sheet of paper. There are so many ways in which the occupation uh, can devastate the identity, the dignity, the self-respect of Palestinian people. And many of those ways are much less salacious than what you'll see on the news, but they're just as terrifying. And that's what I wanted the film to focus on. I, I think that's a, a really key, important, critical point about the occupation, about how the film is going to approach it. Um, Judy Duncan has a question for you about some of the, the logistical challenges in your relationship to the community while you're making this film. Judy, if you'd like, I'd like you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, thank you. Um, I, I was just impressed with how easily you were going back and forth and um, against the contrast of uh, the Palestinian. Could you address why was it so easy for you? Is it really that easy for, um, as, and especially since you, know, you have a journalistic background, was there any kind of um, uh, hoops you had to jump through or there extra barriers? And then the other part of the question would be, um, how were you received from the general public? Were they skeptical of you? Were they um, uh, get this word out? Um, I would like to hear a little bit about that as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the wonderful question. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of entering, uh, American citizens do not need uh, a visa to enter the state of Israel. Uh, Palestine is, of course, occupied by Israel. So what would happen is that I would fly into Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv and then take a taxi or a mass transit uh, into Ramallah. Um, as an American citizen, I'm allowed to do that. Uh, Palestinian folks who live inside of the West Bank are not allowed to leave. They cannot, for example, use the Tel Aviv Airport. You know. Um, I have the same name as the airport. My name is David. It's David Megurian Airport. Uh, I mean, I, there's a there's a privilege, an extreme amount of privilege that I had that was basically allowed me to make this film that would have been much more difficult for someone else. Even if, even an American with an basically with an Arabic name would have had a much more difficult time ever getting to make this project. With, for the basic facts, and I mean, it's it's I don't really think it's debatable. Like you're just under far more scrutiny if you're having an Arabic name and you're flying in and out of Tel Aviv, um, if you even have the permission to do so. Uh, but as an American, it's very, very easy for me to go back and forth. And not to belabor the point, but it, part of the reason it's so easy for Americans to enter the West Bank is there are a huge amounts of settlers with American identification and American passports uh, or, or who come from the States. Uh, this is a, a, a a colony. This is a colonial system that is set up to favor uh, the colonizer. And basically, there's nothing that really distinguishes me from a colonizer when I fly in and out of Palestine, or in, in and out of Israel and visit Palestine, I should say. Um, so there's that. And then um, for your second question, um, you know, I, I Ramallah is small. Uh, it's, it's, you know, 60, 80,000 people, uh, a larger, of course, during the day with, with commuters and everything, but Ramallah is a small city. You can walk across it in 40 minutes, probably. Uh, after a few months, everyone just started to know who I was. And I, I, my, my partner visited me once actually while I was filming and we, I gave her a tour of the city and uh, like four or five people would like see us on the street and honk at me. I was like, hey, it's the camera guy. It's Musa's camera guy. And after a while, she's like, oh, are, are you famous here? Like, <laughs> everyone seems to know you. Uh, but it, it did have, um, it, it didn't take long. And I think the most important thing was, I hate the idea of this phrase that's very popular in, in nonfiction film, which is this idea of a fly on the wall. I, I hate it. Um, it's, I find it offensive. I'm not it's obvious that I'm there. Like, it, like, I'm not fooling anyone in like pretending that I'm a camouflaged, like, of course, I'm the American guy named David with a camera running around 
in 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 the mayor's office like everyone knows that i'm there i would explain myself i would put down the camera i would talk to people i would say what i was doing i would say why i was doing it i would say what i was interested in showing if people had questions i'd, I'd talk to them i and i um it's it's the least i could do if people are giving me their their privacy and their space and their time uh i had relationships with everybody and i needed to and i had i had to have uh relationships with musa of course and his family of course and i wanted to and, and we still talk and we're still very close but basically i i needed people to understand i wasn't just parachuting in uh and and i think that that really helped me be received much better i think uh olivia is saying she can't turn her her um mic or camera on right now but thanks you for making such a, a nuanced film that really shows ramola in all of its complexity um and I, I think that that's something that we we all are grateful for is is getting to see ramola in more of its complexity we had a question come in through um private chat and it's i'm curious to hear more about the moments musa was interacting with foreign diplomats and the kinds of solutions they offered versus what officials were asking for how does that connect to your choices for the film and building a story that was one that Musa and the others maybe wanted told versus one that you wanted to tell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that there's, um, going back to this idea of how the film, I was how I was trying to do things a little differently um, with the film or, or trying to subvert a lot of other kinds of films that I'd seen before on this part of the world. I feel like every documentary I ever see that takes place in the global south and for those who don't know what that word means it basically it's like places that aren't the west um i um i i always see this scene and it's like every movie's got this where it's like the the person either travels to some western country or someone from the western country travels to that person it's like it's usually like sting or bono and they, they play a concert and everything gets better and the person from the global south feels much better and the person from the west obviously feels much better um but i but that's not a reality that i don't think rings true for palestinian people um i found it really quite devastating when i would when i would go on these trips with with musa um this very reluctant diplomat who's trying to explain to people um just a little bit better what 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 the experience is to be a palestinian and the only response that anyone's able to give him is, you know, choir groups, football teams, um, social cultural exchange programs, or what the scene with the German delegation was about for me, which is a really fundamental scene in the film for me. Um, because I think that scene uh, represents good liberal people. Like I think, I think the German folks in that scene represent like just nice ideological, liberal folks who are like oh yeah of course we understand there's a problem but you know wh why can't you guys just get along with israelis um and i think musa's point and response in that scene is one of the more articulate ways i've ever heard anyone um dismiss that idea which is yeah just this basic sense of um that, that there's not um there's not equal ground to stand on and this expectation that well things will get better if you just forget how badly you've been treated and come to the table, that's just not effective. Um, it's not effective when you're talking about the dignity of an entire group of people. And uh, and I really wanted to point out the hypocrisy of some of those moments. And I think I I think that the film is I think that the the film is not as angry as I am. I think that the film is a little more conservative than I am. Um, because I think I think Musa is a little more conservative than I am, um, but but I but I also think that some of that anger in the film is just distilled in these quiet moments. Like for me, there's a lot of anger in that moment where Mayor Hadid is looking at that painting of Jerusalem in Oxford on the wall. There's a lot of symbolism in that moment to me. There's a lot of what of this this idea that that Jerusalem is, you know, this city with histor historically colonized and formerly a British colony and here's this British painter who went and painted it and now the paintings hanging up in a museum that's moments away from other stolen colonial artworks and Mayor Hadid that's the closest he's going to get to Jerusalem that's the closest he can get 
And um, there was there was a lot of of those moments to me in the film, especially when he's talking to the British delegation and when he's in the States and where I really felt like, you know, he was certainly trying um, and he certainly um, had high hopes, uh, but the disappointment was pretty obvious. And I wanted to hint at it without it being too heavy handed. I really appreciate that acknowledgement, you know, that you were potentially more angry than your film is. One of the things that I am continually having to learn and that I've learned through Telos is that you have to say things you're passionate about in a way that can be heard. And so figuring out how to translate those, those deep experiences and anger into a film that can be heard and engaged by people who, you know, aren't there yet. I, I think you've done that really well here. And I'm kind of along that. those yeah, kind of along those lines, I want to go back to what you said about you can't be a fly on the wall and you as an American also getting the news about the embassy move at the same time as the Palestinians. Um, you know, that was a decision on the part of former President Trump, but that's not a policy, policy decision that, you know, deviates too far from any other American president's policy towards Israel and Palestine. I'd be really curious to hear more about what your experience was like being a filmmaker and an American navigating that that context and that emotional reaction when you heard that news, knowing it kind of went against everything you were, you know, potentially working for as well. I've never been asked that question before. That's an interesting one. You know, I guess part of the problem is, and this is maybe more of an existential answer than you're looking for, but I guess I have a very fragmented relationship to my identity as an American. Uh, I. I, as most Americans um, who have my political persuasion, I had a hard time um, relating to my sense of nationality after the election of, of Donald Trump. It felt very difficult for me to feel like I had much in common with, um, with, with uh, the direction my, head, my country seemed headed in from 2016 onwards. Um, and I also, I'm a grandchild of immigrants and grew up in New York, uh, being the only person who looked like me and uh, surrounded by tons of people who were, were different than me. And I basically grew up with a, a tremendous and fierce love of others. Um, and that to me was the sort of prototyp prototypical definition of Americans. So I have a very different idea of what America is than our former president does. And as a result, I remember people would ask me while I was filming uh, Palestinian friends, you know, like what, what was your experience um, with this whole thing? And I, I said, I don't, I can't speak for, I can't speak for my country on this one. It has nothing in common with me. Um, and uh, I actually think that that in, in sort of this little moment of introspection here, um, I, I think that that was really reflected in the approach I had to the film. There's not a lot of nationalism, you know, in, in the idea of running a city and maintaining a city. Of course, there's some very deep um, nationalism in the context of Palestine and, and the Palestinian revolution is deeply rooted, of course, in nationalism and, and, and it's extraordinarily important um, for, for Palestinian folks with the, to, for the, the definition of a nation. Um, but I really did want to focus on the humanistic elements of dignity and self-determination and the very basic idea of just what is it like in your daily life to not have your own country? What does that mean on a fundamental level that you, that you, that you, that you could understand if you're not Palestinian? I wanted to bring that into your heart because I don't think that there's any other way to get it. You're not gonna ever understand what it's like to live in occupation you're not gonna ever know that feeling. If you're lucky, um, you'll get to visit someday. You'll get to have that experience of crossing that checkpoint and being herded like cattle, regardless of what nationality you are and understanding that feeling just for a second, but you'll never ever understand what it's like to be Palestinian. And I can't make you understand that because I can't, I don't understand what it's like, but I can show you certain things that I've seen that gave me an emotional experience. And I can try to give the same emotional experience that I had making the film to you as the audience. And I think that's the best kind of filmmaking is basically the kind that tries to capture a feeling. For example, when I was filming that penultimate scene in the film, this clash outside of city hall, uh, which was which was rather frightening for sure for for everyone involved. Um, probably more so for me because I wasn't used to that. Uh, 
I remember at the end of the night, I had filmed with Musa, I'd filmed with his family. I went home, it was around 1 a.m. I said to myself, wow, tomorrow's going to be a very big day. Everyone's going to be talking about this. Everyone's going to be talking about what just happened. Uh, so I got to bed. Uh, I woke up at 7 a.m. Office started opening at 8. I got up. I, I filmed the rocks being swept off the street. I went into the office. I waited for Musa to show up at his, at his office. He walks in. He looks at me. He says, we've got to go. I was like, what? what's wrong? He said, the school has new doors. There's new doors in the school. You've been following the storyline of the doors in the school for a year and a half, and we've got to go. And that's the, that's the last time we talked about it. And that's when something really snapped into place for me, which is here I am still a year into filming, bringing this baggage in of what people were going to be talking about the next day, what's going to haunt people. No, what ended up being more terrifying to me than anything else was the banality of the occupation was how commonplace it became to the point where something as terrifying as that you just have to move on from because it is everyday life. And that was so much more disturbing than what I thought originally when I first started making the film. And I really wanted to capture that feeling. Yeah, picking up on that, that thread of everyday life reality being more disturbing than I think we sometimes comprehend, even when we visited and, and spent time there, I want to shift back to kind of what's going on right now and what we can do, not just about, you know, urging for the de-escalation of act, active hostilities, you know, universally condemning violence against civilians, but really how can we be on this moment, you know, the news cycle is going to move on. This isn't going to be front page news, hopefully sooner rather than later as, as things de-escalate. The underlying realities of occupation are still there, um, which is a long way of kind of setting up this question. But one of the things I think is really great about the Telos Network is we've got a community of peacemakers who come from really diverse backgrounds, liberals, conservatives, Christians, people who aren't of faith, you know, all coming together to try and advocate for a just future. And I think that one of the, the really powerful tools we have is films like yours or are films like yours. So is there anything you would say to people who maybe are hoping to take this film back to their communities, knowing that those communities are incredibly diverse about how they can help frame the conversation or help show this film to their fan, friends and families who maybe don't have as much understanding to kind of push the conversation towards you know, a deeper understanding of the occupation and the, and the context beyond today's headlines. I, I really appreciate the question. Um, could talk for a whole hour about that question. Um, personally, you know, there's, a, there's an expression that I think Israelis and Palestinians have in common, which is a uh, hundred people, a hundred opinions. I, I, I think personally, my opinion is, um, gotta be gentle with people. People are coming from a really, really fragmented place when it comes to this issue. There's nothing to be gained by making anyone feel bad. There's nothing to be gained by yelling at anybody. There's nothing to be gained by calling someone an endorser of apartheid or a racist. Find me the one person in the entire world who upon being called a racist backs off and says, oh, you know what? You're right, I am a racist, I'm sorry. Like it, like we don't, that's not how we respond. That's not how we have discourse. And um, what we need is discourse. Like that is the thing that will fix these problems. Like we need to be able to talk. I need to be able to be heard. You need to be able to be heard. We can get heard if we meet people where they are. I mean, it, it's just, it's basic where it's like, you know, I was in the grocery store yesterday and I saw a kid having a temper tantrum and the, on like the floor, like flailing around because he wanted candy or something. And I was amazed because I watched this kid's father get on the floor with the kid. And like, and all of a sudden the kids stopped crying. And um, I don't, I feel like that story is somewhat relevant, <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like it's, it's like we got, we have to get on the floor with these people. We have to get on the floor with people that we don't agree with. Meet them where they are. What is it going to cost us our integrity? What, what will happen if we end up beginning, being able to get someone to listen to us? And what I want us to be able to listen to is people's silence and people's fears. People are afraid of talking about this because they've been told all their lives by media. And I don't mean news media. I mean like all media, movies, game shows, television, everything that like this is too complicated for them to understand. And it's about other people who have nothing to do with them. And it's and it gets so much more complicated the more time we spend inside of that world. And then it becomes more fragmented. 
for, for that group of people, it's about religion. For that group of people, it's about race. For this group of people, it's about land. It, 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 it doesn't make sense if you parse it that way. But the way it can make sense is listening to people, meeting them where they are, and understanding where the, where the silence is. I think that's a really big one for me. That's been a big one for me this past week, seeing who's silent and why. Like, why are they silent? Like, like, what's the reason that someone wouldn't want to be like, is this someone who doesn't care about human rights? Or is this someone who maybe thinks that it's dangerous to talk about human rights for certain kinds of people compared to others? There's a discourse that's being flattened. And we need to create a place where it's actually safe to have conversations about Palestine uh, and Palestinian lives, basically. And basically, it's one of the reasons I wanted to make this film. I really wanted... I. I don't think that I think, for example, don't think a lot of like hardcore activists would see my film and get much out of it at all. I don't think the film's for them. I'm not trying to reach someone who's converted already. You know, I'm trying to reach people who like all of a sudden were like, oh, wow, yeah, that, 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 that does feel like there's injustice there. And if that's something that you want to articulate to people who are close to you, there's ways to do it softly. But that's my personal belief. I'm, and, 99 other opinions for 99 other people. Well, I think that's really important. And one of the things that I think is a, a really harmful lie that exists in this Israeli-Palestinian context is that in order to be pro-Israel or pro-Israeli, you can't be pro-Palestinian at the same time. And the work TELUS is doing, trying to build a movement of peacemakers who understand that in order to be pro-Israeli, you have to be pro-Palestinian and vice versa, because there isn't peace or justice for anyone until there is peace and justice for everyone is a really good way for people to enter into this conversation. We're not trying to get people to switch sides. We're getting people to have a more capacious understanding of peace and justice for Palestinians and Israelis. And that means caring about Palestinian human rights and dignity so that everyone can live with freedom, security, and dignity in Israel and Palestine. Um, so on that note, I know we're, we're running a little bit low on time. David, it's been fantastic to have you here with us. Um, I wish we could have you on again. Um, I know you're going to go in and keep doing really great work talking to other groups. Um, but for those on the Telos Network, sharing the mayor as a film with your friends and family and, and talking about it, sharing some of what David has said today or your own perspectives having visited Israel, Palestine and having seen this film is a really great way to get active in this moment where I think there's so much violence we're seeing that can be paralyzing, but can also be a really important catalyst for us to recognize our agency and take action with our friends and families and communities where we do have access. Um, coming up, we've got a, a number of events that I'd like you to you know, mark your calendars for and join us that I think will be of interest as we keep understanding and reacting to this current moment. On, Next Wednesday, May 19th, we'll have a live check-in call at 10 a.m. where you can hear more from the TELOS staff about how we're making sense of and processing and uplifting the voices of people most affected by what's going on right now. Um, on May 25th, we've got an event leading through crisis, Palestinian grassroots movements, where again, you'll be able to hear directly from Palestinian activists on the ground who are sharing more about their experiences right now and hopefully what we can do to support them. Um, and then if you're a fan of movie club as I am, on the 27th, we'll have another movie club with the film The Present, which is currently on Netflix with director Farah Nabolsi. Um, and I, I think my colleague is currently putting in the chat a couple other ways to connect with us. If you subscribe to our newsletter, um, we've been sending out and we'll continue sending out resources for how to get active in this current moment, how to respond and, and start trying to make change and advocate for, for mutual flourishing for Palestinians and Israelis. Um, so once again, David, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a, a really great conversation that I've enjoyed, and I hope everyone else on this call has has really enjoyed and you know learned a lot from as well. Um, appreciate your time, and I hope to see everybody else on another upcoming event soon. Thanks so much for having me.